Lecture 1.1. What is poverty and who are the poor? Creating a common vocabulary. The World Bank's development indicators for 2005 report that 1.1 billion people, or 17.5% of the world's population, lives in extreme poverty. Who are these people? Where do they live? How do they live? What do you think of when you hear the words living in poverty? Asked to choose the three poorest nations of the world, which continent would you point to? Asked to define extreme poverty, what data would you reference? Before we can discuss what, if any, role capitalism plays in alleviating poverty, we have to make sure that we know what poverty is. The goal of this lesson is to create a common understanding to develop a working vocabulary that facilitates discussion of the issues we will focus on in upcoming lessons. The World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the United Nations Poverty Net, indeed virtually all the major organizations dedicated to measuring and alleviating poverty, use income measures, either gross domestic product or gross national income, that is GDP or GNI, per capita, as indicators of people's standard of living or physical well-being. The generally accepted threshold for extreme poverty is an income of less than $1 per person per day, a cutoff line that generates the 1.1 billion population estimate we saw in the last slide. Gross domestic product, or GDP, is defined as the final value of all goods and services produced annually in a country, and it's the most commonly used measure of a nation's total production. GDP is an output or production measure, but we can use it as an indicator of income. Production generates income, that is, resource owners are rewarded for contributing their labor, capital, natural resources, or entrepreneurial efforts to the making of goods and services. Therefore, total income must equal the value of total production, because production is only possible by using resources. Therefore, we can use either measure, GNI, or gross national income, and GDP, or gross domestic product, to indicate standards of living, and be confident that they reflect each other quite accurately. While GDP and GNI tell us interesting things about the size of a nation's economy, it's only when we divide GDP or GNI by population that we get an indication of a country's standard of living. Using GDP per capita, nations of the world can be categorized as low, middle, and high income. As you look at this map of the world, check to see if your mental identification of the poorest places on Earth was accurate. If you're wondering, how do they know this data? You're asking a good question. How do we collect the information that allows us to slot nations into these neat categories? And why can we trust the data? In economically developed countries where people receive their income in money and where governments keep tax records, the data to estimate total production and total income are relatively easy to collect. But what about in impoverished countries where most people rarely see money and the productive process to which they, quote, contribute their labor resource is their own subsistence farming. Those living in extreme poverty tend to receive their income not in money, but in kind. A farmer who plants and harvests rice that his family eats receives his income in the form of grain. A goat herd's income is milk and meat and the things he trades them for. So how do we count that? Where income data like GDP and GNI are either missing, hard to get, or not considered reliable, poverty researchers have come to rely heavily on consumption data. Consumption measurements have proven to be especially accurate indicators of standard of living in developing countries. And this makes intuitive sense. Consumption is, after all, dependent upon income. There are only two things a person can do with income, consume it or save it. Under conditions of extreme poverty, people may not know where the next meal is coming from, let alone have a savings account. So since savings can safely be assumed to be zero, their consumption equals their production, or output, 
their income. Therefore, instead of relying on estimates or simply dividing GDP by population in poor nations, poverty researchers have turned to data from household surveys. They interview a representative sample of households, asking people about the goods and services they consumed in a recent time period. The resulting data is converted to monetary values. In addition to accounting for in-kind income, consumption surveys also allow researchers to circumvent not always cooperative with governments that may be reluctant or unable to provide accurate income data. Equally important is the analytical role that household consumption research plays. It allows us to check whether the per capita data accurately reflects a population's general standard of living. The problem of per capita data, like GDP or GNI per capita, is the problem of all averages or means. They tend to smooth out differences. Here's a simplified example to illustrate the point. This fictitious nation of five people has a gross national income of $100,400, or a per capita income of $20,080. The per capita average misleads us about the extreme poverty experienced by all but one person in the group. Now, notice that if Javier, in a fit of generosity, gave each of the others $15,000, their standard of living would improve dramatically, but the per capita income would be exactly the same. 100400 divided by 5 still equals $20,080. The value of consumption surveys is that they would reveal that most of the people in this fictional country were living well below the $1 per day threshold rather than in the lap of luxury that the per capita average might indicate. Fortunately, many developing countries have extensive consumption data dating to the 1990s or before. China and India, home to many, many millions of the world's poor, have large, accurate household surveys going back several decades. And what does the survey data tell us? Interestingly, it reinforces our confidence in the general estimate of world poverty that we reached using income data. Both assumption data and output measures, income data, give us similar pictures of the magnitude and distribution of poverty. One more caveat. It's important to note here that comparisons of standard of living among nations, like those that form the basis for this map, are valid only if the measurement tool is standardized. First, nominal income values are converted to real values to eliminate the effects of inflation. Then, income is converted to U.S. dollars and indexed to purchasing power parity. The result is that if we know that a person living on $1 a day in the United States can afford to buy a half loaf of bread and nothing else, then the person we represent in a developing nation as living on $1 a day would also be scraping by on half a loaf of bread. In our discussion of how economists use per capita income as a measurement of extreme poverty, it's probably occurred to many of you that that's not the data we hear about or see in media reporting, or the data offered to us in pleas for support by charitable and non-governmental organizations. The United Nations Human Development website, for example, talks about more concrete measures of deprivation, what are usually known as the social indicators of poverty. Across the world, we see unacceptable levels of deprivation in people's lives. Of the 4.6 billion people in developing countries, more than 850 million are illiterate. Nearly a billion lack access to improved water sources, and 2.4 billion lack access to basic sanitation. Nearly 325 million boys and girls are out of school, and 11 million children under age 5 die each year from preventable causes, equivalent to more than 30,000 a day. Anticipating that students, too, will gain their impressions of world poverty from visual media and pleas for assistance, we need to address the question of whether social indicator data paint a different picture than per capita income. And the clear answer is no. 
per capita income has proven to be an extremely good proxy or surrogate for social indicators. Here's one example. Many studies have confirmed a strong positive correlation across countries between child mortality rates and per capita income. So we could use per capita income to accurately predict infant mortality. Another distinction that should become part of our working vocabulary about poverty is the difference between income and wealth. Textbooks tell us that economists conceive of income as a flow and wealth as a stock. What does that mean? Here's a familiar circular flow diagram where income is represented by the flow of dollars on the inner red circle. Income is dynamic. It's the flow of receipts over time a person's earnings per year, for example, or a business owner's profit. Sometimes income takes the form of money, but as we mentioned earlier, the extremely poor usually receive their income in kind. It's the food they produce with their labor, for example. Wealth, on the other hand, is the accumulated assets people have acquired with their income. Wealth data is not used in measurements of poverty, although wealth clearly affects standard of living. And so in some cases, this exclusion could be misleading. Excluding consideration of wealth per capita has the potential to be especially deceptive in measuring poverty in developed countries, where older people who have amassed considerable wealth may be mistakenly included in poverty statistics because they no longer earn much income. This is, however, less of an issue in our study of world poverty. People living in extreme poverty in poorer nations have little opportunity to accumulate wealth. Although, as we'll see in Lesson 2, we tend to underestimate their wealth when it's not represented by legal documentation. So, per capita income provides us a convenient and useful measure of poverty, as long as we recognize that it doesn't tell us how income in any particular nation is distributed. And that is an important qualifier. Although our focus in this unit is on the creation rather than the distribution of wealth, we recognize that income distribution is an important consideration. To that end, a discussion of income distribution has been added in the appendices to Lesson 1. To complete our vocabulary building exercise, we turn to the conceptual and empirical distinctions between absolute and relative poverty. Absolute poverty is identified by comparing standard of living to an established minimum level of material well-being. People whose incomes fall below the level necessary to maintain that established standard are considered to be absolutely poor. As we've indicated, the generally accepted minimum threshold for the world is the standard of living that could be supported by an income of $1 per person per day. People living below this standard of absolute poverty are the 1.1 billion people the World Bank labels extremely poor. When these minimum income thresholds are established by individual nations, they're called poverty lines. Poverty lines differ as each country determines its own acceptable standard, but because they identify the poor with reference to a specific income level, they all identify absolute poverty. The other way to identify the poor is by comparing the living standards of different individuals or groups. Poverty identified in this way is called relative poverty. Logically, there must be relative poverty and relative wealth in any society in which there is a range of incomes. Some people will always be poorer and some always richer than others, regardless of whether the range of incomes is very high or very low. Relative poverty is surely an issue of modern day concern, but the lessons in Is Capitalism Good for the Poor were designed to focus on absolute poverty, the poverty identified by the $1 per person per day threshold. American students are much more likely to be aware of relative poverty than of the absolute poverty that plagues much of the developing world. This means that one of the first things we have to do is to help students think in terms of this extreme level of deprivation, a level about which they are likely to have little knowledge and sometimes, sadly, even little awareness. 
Poverty in the United States is relative poverty. Indeed, the American poverty line is over $10 per person per day. In fact, as data in Appendix 1 illustrates, people labeled poor in the developed Western countries are actually relatively rich by world standards. Thus, the lessons in this unit pay little attention to U.S. poverty. But I'd assert here that this is not an oversight, and it's not intended to trivialize the plight of America's poor. It is instead a choice to focus on one type of poverty, the absolute poverty of developing countries, and to perhaps save the study of poverty in developed nations for another day and another lesson unit. As we learned in the earlier lecture overview of world economic history, absolute poverty was the norm of human existence through most of man's history. Modern economic historians Nathan Rosenberg and L. E. Birdsell, Jr. summarize the centuries of historical research. If we take the long view of human history and judge the economic lives of our ancestors by modern standards, it is a story of almost unrelieved wretchedness. The typical human society has given only a small number of people a humane existence, while the great majority have lived in abysmal squalor. A startling thought, but the 17th century British philosopher Thomas Hobbes probably captured it best in his pithy characterization of the life of man as solitary, nasty, brutish, and sh Words like squalor, brutish, and sh short give us plenty of reason to study absolute poverty with an eye to plotting its end. Fortunately, a closer look at the history of economic development offers hope that the goal is reachable. Since 1750, when modern economic growth began in Europe, human society has made noteworthy inroads against the nastiness of poverty, in some locations. Increased agricultural output made possible by the Industrial Revolution resulted in a sustained decline in absolute poverty in Europe, for instance. Since the early 1800s, the percentage of the world's population living in extreme poverty has fallen from about 80% to the 17.5% currently estimated by the World Bank. But, you caution, just because the percentage fell doesn't mean that we have less poverty. And for most of the last two centuries, your point would be well taken. As population grew, so did the total number of poor people, even as the percentage living in poverty declined. However, around 1980, the number of absolutely poor people, as defined by the $1 per person per day threshold, peaked at about 1.4 billion. By the turn of the 21st century, it had fallen to 1.2 billion, and in the last five years, has declined by another 100 million, even as total world population has continued to grow. It is this dramatic change in the picture of world poverty that commands our attention and will form the basis for our ensuing discussion. So, to further solidify the common ground for that discussion, let's add some more details to our contemporary picture of world poverty. The first striking fact is that virtually the entire recent decline in world poverty has occurred in two nations, China and India. Household survey data indicates that in China, both the number and the percentage of the poor has dropped dramatically, and in India, the percentage of the poor has fallen by half. Now, as an aside here, let me mention that this graph uses India's and China's own poverty lines which are far lower than the $1 per person per day we've adopted as our indicator of absolute poverty. There are, obviously, still more than 30 million poor people in China, but the graph nonetheless is good news, showing a consistent trend of declining poverty. The improvements in Asia have been so spectacular that the aggregated world data actually obscures the sad reality at the other end of the spectrum. Even as world totals have been falling, the grip of poverty on the nations of sub-Saharan Africa has grown dismally tighter. In this part of Lesson 1, then, we've provided an overview of the location and condition of the world's poor.
and we've proposed a common vocabulary for measurement and discussion of poverty. We've also reviewed the history of poverty, noting the long-term trends since the Industrial Revolution and the sharp change that occurred in the last quarter of the 20th century. And we've identified a stark disparity within the ranks of the developing countries that will help us to understand why some are moving along the road out of poverty and others are not. In the second half of Lesson 1, we'll continue the task of developing a common vocabulary, this time turning our attention from poverty to capitalism as we prepare to answer the question of whether capitalism is good for the poor.